its prey. Our Father in heaven, we just want to say thank you for what you're doing in various parts of the world. Places where your spirit seems to be working uh, amazingly and uh, response is happening and it's creating challenge like Papua New Guinea. And thank you for the generosity of those who have given here today. But we also pray for harder places like the Middle East. And uh, if we think we've got challenges, they have 7,000 members in a population of 601 million. May you encourage them too. Thank you that we can be involved in mission and may you challenge us through Jesus Christ. Amen. If uh, you didn't come prepared for the offering for PNG, uh, you can use e-giving or the web and there is these that you can fill out and I'm told you can go to the conference reception and do FTOS as well. Well, it's good to be here. Um, I was telling the juniors earlier this morning that more than 55 years ago, I gave my, I had my first understanding of Jesus as a boy in Canberra. My father was the pastor of the National uh, Church. It wasn't the building now, it was the other one, and we lived in the house next door, and that's where it happened where Jesus became real to me. So to be back in this area is always a good thing uh, for me. I bring greetings from, uh, from over 600,000 Seventh-day Adventists in the South Pacific. We are the place in the world that there are more Seventh-day Adventists per head of population than anywhere else. And if we took out Australia, where it's about one to every 450, the rest of the Pacific would be one to every 24 people, a Seventh-day Adventist. We thank God for that, but that now gives us the challenge, and the General Conference is challenging us, what about Asia? We used to care for Asia from Sydney. And now it's cared from the Philippines. Now, God's doing amazing things in the Philippines as well. But the rest, north of us, there are some real challenges. And uh, so we have a mission refocus uh, there. And this union, the Australian Union, is uh, adopted the Southeast Asian Union, a new union there, and uh, we have missionaries going there uh, as well. And we want to see missionaries from all over um, and revive that mission spirit wherever we go. Now, I have so many things I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, these are my colleagues. Um, Francois Keith is uh, an Australian from South Africa, Mike Sakuri is a Rituman from Fiji, it's the Polynesian island of uh, Fiji, he's the secretary, CFO is Francois and we serve this great division who has that vision of being a thriving disciple making movement. That's how we started as a church and that's how we will finish and there are places even in Muslim controlled uh, religious countries where there are disciple-making movements happening that are Adventist, which is just amazing. Um, that's our mission statement from the General Conference. We're a division of the General Conference, and so we have the same mission statement. Make disciples with our last day message, because Jesus is about to come. And uh, that's what we're here, here for, and we're glad to do it. In Australia, we have to report as a registered charity to the Charity Commission. They want a purpose statement, so we hope 
that when Seventh-day Adventists are around, our community says they inspire hope and wholeness of lives in our communities. We want Adventists around. And last night, uh, your president uh, was solid but not fancy, and um, he's going to get that a whole lot. (laughs) Uh, And he deserves it, probably. But it just showed that the heart for, for wanting to see that mission happen in this, this conference because we want everybody to become someone who is more like Jesus in every way, in our generosity, in handling our emotions, in our relationships, in our spiritual lives, becoming more like Jesus. And we want to reclaim a promise. And I want you to grab your Bibles or your devices and come to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And here we want to reclaim the the call and the meaning of the call of Abraham to the world. And Genesis chapter 12 and the first three verses. The Lord had said to Abram, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on the earth will be blessed through you. Blessed to be a blessing. Terah had received the call and his son Haran and, and Abraham and Nahor, they all left Ur of the Chaldees. But Haran became famous on the way and made a town and Terah and all of them stayed there. But God called Abraham and Haran's nephew comes along and says, I am blessing you as you follow my call of going so that you can be a blessing. What is a blessing? Well, the Hebrew word is barak. Now, I can't say it like a a Jew. Barak. You want to try? Barak. It literally means to, to kneel or praise and to give a status of or a declaration of blessing, of favour and benefits to another person. And so here, God is saying to Abraham, I'm going to declare a blessing over you. I'm going to put you in a state of blessing where you will receive the favour and benefits of me, the almighty God. Wow. Wow. Who would like that kind of barak? Yeah. And that's what Abraham receives. But it is also opposite to the curse. And, and curses are a declaration. And let me tell you, there are people in our country who are cursing us, literally, praying prayers to another god, We know who it is, and asking that there be a state of destruction come upon anyone who believes and follows God. And God says, yep, he knows that. But if you're under his blessing, God will work it out. And and here it's... Like it's just beautiful, this call. Follow me. Yeah, I'll give you land. I'll make you 
lots of nations, but I will be your God. I state a blessing over you, but it's not just for you. You are to bless others, and eventually all families, where all families of this earth will be blessed. Now, what about Abraham? Was he blessed? As we just look at his story, just briefly. Yes, he was blessed. He received lots of gifts of, of uh, livestock and riches from the Pharaoh. He received a blessing from Melchizedek, the priest and king of Jerusalem. He received gifts from the Philistine king, Abimelech. There were times that he was definitely blessed with the things of this world. There are other times that I'm sure he did not feel blessed. When he had to leave the promised land and go to Egypt. He says, God, but you called me here and now there's drought and I've got to survive. And he goes to Egypt. I don't think he, feel blessed. he felt blessed when he came back out of Egypt with a whole lot of goods. And his nephew Lot as well. And he says, well, we can't live in this part of the land together. There's the really good land over here, and there's the not-so-good land here. Uh, look, Lot, you decide what you want. I mean, after all, you know, my older brother, you're my older brother's son, and he picks the good land. And Abraham goes, yeah, you little upstart. No, no I don't know. It does not, that doesn't say it. It's not in the Bible. But you can kind of imagine that he didn't really feel blessed when his nephew took the best land. And all of the time, he's saying, you're going to have a lot of descendants and you're going to have a son. And his wife is getting older and he is getting older. And she gets past childbearing age and waits for more than 20 years. And he's going, God, you're going to bless me with a son. But man, this has taken a long time. I don't feel your blessing. And then he rescues Sodom and Gomorrah. And we know what ends up with them. Why would he go and do that? And then they just, pff, grace, gone. So he didn't feel blessed at times. Now, there were times that I'm sure he was a blessing as well. He allowed Lot to take the fertile land. Lot would have thought, Uncle Abraham, what a wonderful blessing you are to me. So he was a blessing. When he rescued Lot from the four kings of the north, just with 318 people. Wow. What a man. A blessing. When he returned tithe to Melchizedek, he blessed the Lord and Melchizedek. He interceded for Sodom, and Sodom didn't even know. No, Lord, if there's 40, will you spare it? What about 30, 20? And Sodom doesn't even know. What a blessing he was uh, throughout his life at times. But there were times that he wasn't much of a blessing. When he told, I'm not sure I would like to have been Sarah. You know, beautiful woman. Abraham was happy, but when he goes to a foreign place, well, you know, she's not really my, she's my sister. And he lets her go into Pharaoh's um, group of, of women. You think he had learned the lesson, but he did the same with Abimelech, the Philistine. I mean, Sarah would think, are you really a blessing? I, I, I mean, I'm just thinking about it. And then when Sarah says, well, look, I'm not having a child. Take my servant. And he does what Sarah says. And then Sarah gets upset because Hagar treats um, her not so well because she's the one who's born a male child. And uh, she complains to Abraham, it's all your fault. 
And um, Abraham says, it's got nothing to do with me. You do whatever you like. And so she sends Hagar and Ishmael out. If you were Hagar and Ishmael, you would not feel blessed. So you see, Abraham was blessed to be a blessing. And there were times he was blessed and there were times that he didn't feel he was blessed. There were times he was a blessing and there were times that I'm not sure he really was a blessing. But it's interesting as you go through the story of Abraham's ups and highs and his lows and ups and downs as he journeys, God is constant. After Lot had taken the best land, God comes and says to him, you're feeling a bit down. He knows. He says, look at all of this land. You go and walk on it. Your possession, your um, inhabitants will take all of this land as their possession. Trust me. I've blessed you. You're under the blessing of God. He was blessed by Melchizedek, a beautiful blessing, the one who, the God who defeated his enemies. And straight after that, Abraham's thinking, I go and I rescue Lot out of kind of an impulse. I've just taken on four kings of the north and defeated them. They're going to come back. I'm not even a king, I'm a nothing. And they're going to get me. And what does the Lord do? Do not be afraid, Abram. I will protect you and be your very great reward. You see, the blessing is that God, despite you not being a blessing at times and being a blessing, the real blessing is that God does not give up. That God is with you and he is your reward and he, his promises are there and continue because they come again. I will make you extremely fruitful. This is when he's told to circumcise everybody in his uh, camp. And then he says, it's not Hagar that's going to have the son of promise. It is Sarah and you're going to have to just trust me. And that's where the everlasting covenant will come. And so when he gets discouraged, the God of the universe keeps telling him, you may laugh, you may think you won't have a son to Sarah, but one day your laugh will be a laugh of joy, not of cynicism. Because that is what God is like. I've got three things to tell you today. That was the first thing. The second thing is this. We can reclaim that blessing in Christ. Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says, That in Christ, united in Christ, we have every spiritual blessing available from heaven. Everyone. We are like Abraham. We have had God's declaration and his statement of blessing over us in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. So we are blessed to be a blessing. Last month, a few pastors from this conference joined about 70 others in the North American uh, boot camp and e-huddle, some of them, where Pastor Rome uh, was, and the conference called Exponential. And the leader of the Exponential Conference is Pastor Dave Ferguson. And he and his brother, um, John, have written a book based on how do people in American society who follow Jesus be a blessing to others. And he leads the biggest missional conference in the United States 
for evangelism and that's why there were uh, some Adventists that were a part of that. And he says it's just easy. This is the, f- the, f- the four things you do. You, be- you start praying for people. You listen to their stories, their challenges. That informs your prayer even more. You then eat with them, mix with them. And in the eating, you will learn how you can serve them. And then you just share what God has done in your life. And that is the easiest way to bless other people. So begin with prayer. Let me tell you, around the, the, the division, we have huge needs. One of our challenges is Avondale University. Like all universities in Australia and around the world, student numbers have declined significantly because of COVID. And we need students at Avondale. So what are we doing about it? Yeah, we're marketing and doing all of that, but we gather together regularly to pray because nothing can happen without prayer. And your president said that last night as well. We need to be a praying people, and I'm glad Pastor Ben is leading us in different prayer in the meetings here. Second, we need to listen. If I could take you to um, the Pacific, one in 20, uh, sorry, one person in every 20 minutes has a limb removed in the South Pacific. Why? Because of type 2 diabetes. As a church, we have seen this. We have been listening to the people. And we have created a response to the listening. And it is not a top-down initiative. It's a grassroots initiative called 10,000 Toes, where there are over 10,000 volunteers who have been trained in basics of lifestyle medicine, who go from village to village, suburb, settlement, town, and and test people first and then teach them how to deal with it. We have 13 governments in the South Pacific saying this is one of their major strategies to do with type 2 diabetes. It's called 10,000 Toes and it only came because we listened. And and the program there, these are some of the volunteers from Papua New Guinea, is opening up, I can tell you it is opening up villages and places for amazing things because when you listen, things happen. Then, eat with people. The Nandi English Church did the 10,000 toes. Most of the people there around that church are Indo-Fijian, Hindus. They call this their church now. Why? Because through the 10,000 toes, they say, we no longer, we can feel our toes in our hands now. We've lost kilograms. We can sleep now. We can, we can walk now without feeling kind of whatever. And our husbands and our children are saying the same things. Thank you. And then they sit down and they eat and conversations start. It's amazing what is happening. These Hindu ladies call the Nandi English Church their church. Listen. Then we serve. I went to the Namia Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first time in 2016. And I went there, and when, you fin- when I finished preaching, everybody just left. But a few people and the pastor. And I kind of thought, wow, this is a healthy church. Not. Because <laughs> healthy churches just love to be together. I was there last year. Church finished. There were people there an hour and a half later, and not one or two, dozens of them still talking. What's happened? Well, they got a new pastor, Dr. Hatsa, a missiologist, the Mauritian. And he listened and found out what the issue was with the congregation. 
There were the Kanak, the Melanesian, on one side. And there were the Kaladosh, the French colonialists, on the other side. And neither the two would meet. Racial tension in the church. He was able to listen to both sides and, and work out the commonality. He brought them together and saying, in Christ, we are one. We have every spiritual blessing. And one of those blessings in Ephesians chapter 1 is the unity that we have. There's no longer Gentiles and, uh, and Jews. We are one in Christ. And he started to work all that together. And, and amazingly, the people listened and learned to hear each other. And that there was more than one way to skin a kangaroo. And I know that because the colored dosh wanted to do church this way and the kanak were going we want to do it this way but they worked it all out but out of that they started not just talking about themselves they started serving other people and two kanak families lived in four high rise well there were four big high rises just out of Numea were full of Kanak people. And the two Adventists had lived there for years and done nothing. And they realized now, hey, they are blessed to be a blessing. What could they do for the people? So they started asking their neighbors, what would you like us to do? And they said, could you take us shopping? Could you take us to the doctor's appointment? Can you do this? And they said, sure, we'll do that whenever we, we're able to. Or could you care for our children? We need to go off and do something. Simple things like that was there last year. One man spoke to us in French translation. These people loved me like nobody else ever loved me. I've lived here in these high rises all my life and I have never seen what has happened here. You're welcome in my home because I know you believe a God and I want to follow the God that you show. Opened up his home. They did a discovery Bible reading. And here, we're with the, the Sabbath, the Kanak elder holding the microphone with the color dosh there helping. And they have had six baptisms in six months. And uh, this is the kids that they care for um, and... The, the actual people, uh, the police in the area said crime has gone down since you Adventists have been involved in serving this community. Serving makes a big difference. The, 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 the last thing is to share. What do you share? You share the gospel, the good news of Jesus. The Kaladosh... And the elder is a colored dosh. You can see colonialist, same color skin. And the man behind him is Emmanuel. He's also colored dosh. He moved out of Numea to a village called Tomo. Really religious village. It had a Catholic church. No mass any day. No mass any week. If you're lucky, mass once a month and two people go to it. But they're Catholic. And um, Emmanuel and his wife are good gardeners, so they have excess produce. They just start sharing it with the people around, serving them. He's a great fisherman, and he starts sharing fish around with, with them. As he gets to know the people around, two of them are praying that God will show up in town. And they believe that Emmanuel and his wife are an answer to prayer. They start praying together. These are not Adventist people. They start praying together. And as they start praying, they're saying, people are starting to ask questions about what is happening in our village since you people have come to serve us. They start a discovery Bible reading again, and they have 40 people midweek. And the first person baptized is the guy with the hat on. And if you can see my profile, I'm just beside, beside him. They've baptized four people. And the Kanak are helping the Kaladosh as the Kaladosh are helping the Kanak. Very, very simple ways of blessing people. 
It's all part of our big strategy for the South Pacific Division. Last thing. Genesis 22, to pull it all together. Come with me to Genesis 22. This is a story that people know very well. But I've got to say, the Jews say it is the most important chapter in the whole book of Genesis. They have a special name for it. I have shared this chapter with lots of unchurched people and they all ask the same question. You know what it is. Why was Abraham tested and asked to kill his son? Crazy. God is different. The other gods are in their nations around allowed people and wanted people to give their sons as sacrifices and, and, and daughters. And that happened. And the Bible clearly says, Abraham God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. If I was Abraham, the first question I would have asked, is that you, Lord? But if you had followed earlier, through Abraham's journey of ups and downs, God was always faithful and continually talking to Abraham. Abraham had no doubt because God had spoken to him many times. This was the call of God. I'm sure he had doubts and questions. But that God who had been with him in Egypt and with the Philistines and, and fighting the, the kings of the north, the God who had, had, had led him was calling him and he must go. So he gets ready. Doesn't talk to Sarah. There may have been good reason for that. Takes Isaac and a couple of servants, donkey, wood, fire, and they go. And then it says, uh, look, there's the place to go. And Abraham uh, says, you, you, you boys, uh, servants, you stay here. And he says, the boy and I will travel a little further we will worship there, and then we will come back. What? God's asked you to kill your son, and you're saying to these servants, we will come back. How easy was it to say that? How sure are you, Abram? Do you really believe that? What about being obedient? Now, Isaac's no fool. As they're just two of them, he says, Dad, I'm carrying the wood. He's the strong one. You're carrying the fire. Nobody's carrying the sacrifice. I don't know how you, if you were Abraham, how you would reply and how easy it would be to reply. Verse 8, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. And they walked on. When my son was between two and three years of age. We were on holidays at Stewart's Point and we're in the surf together with a whole lot of family around. The surf was really gentle that day, just rolling. And I had him in my arms, family around, looking out to sea and these little one foot waves would come. You know, it's clear as crystal. No wash or churn or anything. And he'd say, Daddy, another one coming. Jump. 
and we'll just do a little like that and you rise up in the wave and whatever. Turn my back. Anybody knows anything about surf? Freak waves are real. Ripped him out of my arms. I can still feel it. Oh no! I'm going to have to give up my son. And I will be blamed. Not intentionally that I'm doing this. I can tell you, I took a deep breath, opened my eyes up, and now it was just sand and churn and whatever, and went down, and I'm a diver, and I can stay there under a long time, and I was around and whatever, looking and feeling and whatever, and, and others had known what had happened, and they're all calling out to all our family around, Travis is down. I come up again and the same thing go down and, you know, I've gone out of breath. And I'm going, if I've gone out of breath, what's a little two-year-old? Well, something hit my wife's leg. She reached down and grabbed a little leg and pulled it to the surface. He spluttered. And looked her in the eye and said, Mummy, very dark and scary down there. For a few minutes, I think I know what Abraham felt. I didn't want to give up my son. No way! Well... Isaac must have had similar faith to Abram. But it's the only place in the Bible that they tie a sacrifice to the altar. Because I guess if you see a knife coming down, your reaction, and if you're bigger and stronger, would be to protect yourself. I don't know. But we know what happens. God says, Abraham, Abraham. I now know. Don't lay a hand on the boy. And now Abraham sees the ram in the thicket and he says, On the mountain of the Lord, the Lord provided. Why was Abraham tested and asked to kill his son? It's the only answer I can come up with and I'm interested if you've got a better one. That as the human through which the blessing would come to every family in the world, he understood the cost of that blessing. Giving up his one and only son. And it is here at the end of... Uh, this, this story, that we, we see the providence of God. The Lord provided a substitute ram for Isaac, but the Lord provided a substitute son of man for the whole world. And if you read Genesis 22 very carefully and you compare it to the best known verse in all scripture, you will find if it's in the Hebrew, although John is written in Greek, it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And where do you find that language from? Genesis 22. 
And here it is. Because you have obeyed me and not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my name that I will certainly bless you. And then it goes on and puts it all together. And then verse 18, the only time that it's repeated from chapter 12, and through your descendants, all nations on the earth will be blessed. Because you have obeyed me. Faith leads to obedience. And that faith in the God who will provide, not just for you, but for your Hindu, your Muslim, your secular workmate, neighbor. And we have just all been blessed in Christ, like Abraham, to be a blessing. Let's go out and go like Abraham not just follow the general conference strategic plan, but go and be a blessing. May God bless us in Jesus.